I, I'm going to ask the, the, the three speakers to, to come up to the panel, please. You know, we've heard um, three different ways of looking at pluripotent cells to help model processes, whether it's disease or differentiation or development. Just to stimulate the conversation and, and to keep it at a high level about this, I'm going to throw out some suggested questions that the panelists or that you may want to address when we talk about using pluripotent cells to model disease. The first is, can you really model a disease in a dish in isolation of the rest of the body, an intact vascular system, an intact immune system, in isolation of all the other lineages that interact with a particular cell? When you do find a difference between uh, a diseased cell, quote unquote, and a normal cell, can you find a difference that's clinically meaningful? In other words, can it account for the symptomatology of the actual patient. I think Joe indicated that some of the things that you actually see in the cardiomyocytes in a dish do reflect what you might see if you do an AKG. Is it the same for the nervous system or for the blood system? And even if it isn't really able to, if you find a phenotype, even if it can't account for what the symptom, for the symptoms of the actual patient, is it still a reasonable surrogate? Can you uh, can you use it for drug discovery? Can it be a metric? Can you uh, construct it so that it triggers a reporter that also then is clinically informative? Um, what about the issue that the cells that we get are inevitably young cells, but very often we want to model diseases of aging and maturation? For example, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, or can we model disease that have a cyclic, relapsing, remitting kind of character to them? Does the actual act of culturing them and certainly reprogramming change the disease? For example, if you alter the, the telomere lengths in the course of reprogramming, do you actually lose the very act of inspecting it? Does, does it change what you are trying to model? What are the best cells to model a particular disease? Should they be pluripotent? Should they be tissue resident or tissue derived? Or should they be a direct transdifferentiation, perhaps from an accessible tissue like a fibroblast directly to a cardiomyocyte or, or to a blood cell or to a nerve cell? And then one of the biggest challenges, we heard how well one can model monogenic diseases but uh, major, major challenges obviously those diseases that are complex polygenic and multifactorial. So I'm going to leave these questions up just to help stimulate the conversation and open it up to the audience to, uh, to ask those or any questions that you might have. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, well, that's uh, not very promising. <laughs> yes, so no, since nobody... I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether you're asking people to sort of pick a number. No, 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 no. <laughs> this was to... To stimulate you to ask questions, you don't have to ask these questions. You can ask whatever question either came to, popped into your head while the speakers were talking, or the speakers can respond to any of those questions. I just wanted to respond to this whole litany of things that you've written here. I think they're great, but you will be paralyzed if you put all these questions all the time. This is what started three years ago, people talking. Just look at the tremendous progress we have. So I, I think this is good to have them, but the fact of the matter is you, you're making yourself too many difficult things. <laughs> Go by the things. I mean, it's amazing number of things that have already happened. All these questions were there a few years ago. You are learning a lot. I mean, I was very impressed yesterday hearing a postdoctoral fellow from Rusty's lab. They have made these cell lines for schizophrenia, and they're using different drugs now, and they can actually predict from that which drug will work on which cell. And in fact, in many cases, that is the case. Well, that's pretty impressive. So I'm not trying to minimize what you say, but I think let's not be paralyzed, keep moving forward. I think we had a question over here, actually. Are you sure? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Great, thank you very much. Um, um, Joe, I was uh, very impressed by your ability to sort of recapitulate um, the disease phenotype by a single um, uh, a genetic uh, change um, in the wild type. Um, uh, cardiomyocyte model, but I question, you know, I'll play devil's advocate here, you know, um, do we anticipate that'll be the case with uh, other uh, monogenetic diseases that the uh, phenotype will be completely recapitulated by, you know, a single 
uh, sort of genetic change, you know, for rare diseases, um, you know, such as uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or, or FSHD or, or even ALS, where it seems like there's a spectrum of uh, phenotypes associated with specific mutations? Yeah, so, so it's a very good question. I think the question is on, you know, what I've shown you are examples of uh, DCM uh, with the troponin T mutation and SGM with the myosin heavy chain 7 mutation. I think other people uh, uh, have shown different mutations for ARVD, different mutations for CPVT, uh, and different mutations along QT that clearly recapitulate phenotype. The question then is, uh, what about not what about the not so dominant mutations? Uh, what about the genetic variants? Uh, so that's what about genetic variants of known significance versus genetic variants of unknown significance? So these are the kind of questions that people would <coughs> be tackling uh, the next phase. Uh, one classic sample would be, you know, in cardiology, we do a lot of these clinical trials uh, looking at <coughs> GWAS studies, and most of these SNPs that come out of GWAS has an odds ratio of 1.2, 1.3. After, third, after, you know, after 20 or 30 years, none of us is still ordering a GWAS uh, SNP uh, to predict the patient's risk. Is it possible that you use this platform to really confirm your GWAS hit is, not, uh, is, is true or not true? Meaning that uh, it's very possible for the postdocs <coughs> in this audience uh, to take a isogenic line. And you say an IP, if you say an IP21, which is a pretty well-known uh, GWAS uh, for predicting coronary artery disease, you could introduce it in the isogenic uh, uh, setting to see what's the risk. If you have a GWAS uh, that predicts atrial fibrillation, you have a GWAS that pre predicts heart failure, just introduce it. These kind of studies will be done uh, in the next uh, few years. Um, and I think, you know, getting back to the question that Evans uh, was uh, mentioning, uh, in our field, uh, if you want to study cardiac disease, uh, I'm not <coughs> sure if you're a postdoc how much improvement you can do if you keep on studying mouse neonatal cardiomyocytes. If I were a postdoc today, I'm going to spend my career trying to figure out how do you improve IPSL cardiomyocyte differentiation? How do you get lineage specification? How do you get maturation? Because there's plenty of room for improvement in this area. If the, traditional techniques of studying CHO cells and traditional technique of studying uh, neonatal cardiomyocyte. I'm not sure there's much, uh, much area for improvement. But what you're pointing out, a lot of us are uh, <coughs> embarking on it. We have several studies uh, looking at these uh, particular issues. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I'm, I, I, while, I'm, while other people are thinking of questions, I am curious about the question about um, how does one use this how does one model diseases of aging and of maturation? There, it's very prevalent in the nervous system, but even in, the, in, in, in cardiology, uh, Vincent Chen, for example, over at the Sanford Burnham yeah. studied a disease which only developed as the cells metabolically aged. So he, he didn't see a phenotype until he artificially aged them in a dish. What do you think about? Yeah, I think you know Tom. Uh, Tom is kind of one of the world's experts on aging. who will probably give a uh, much uh, better uh, elucidation of this whole uh, issue. I think in our experience, for example, um, it all depends on the exact readout. Uh, let's say, for example, if you take uh, IPSL cardiomyocytes from uh, Juan Carlos and myself, chances are if you, the readout, if your readout is heart rate probably, you know, the beating heart rate is about the same. In fact, his heart rate, my heart rate, is probably the same as well. So it all depends on what is the exact readout that you're asking. Uh, most of the readouts out there, uh, you know, will be dissimilar. I think in our experience, uh, when we want to elucidate or when we want to uh, pull out some additional readouts, we usually stress the cell. So we give uh, the cell some isopaternal, <coughs> we give the cells uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know, ischemia stress to simulate a hypoxia. So uh, for different fields and different cell types, you'll, you know, you'll be quite different. But in the cardiac cells, uh, if you want to elucidate, or if you want to pull out the phenotype, you probably have to add something. Aging is probably a much difficult uh, issue. I'm not sure if there's uh, ways to uh, induce aging. I think a lot of people have talked about, you know, telomere shortening and talk about different culturing conditions. Uh, we, you know, in, in our case, uh, 
we've done a lot of uh, steps in terms of uh, trying to induce maturation of the cardiomyocytes. Notice we call them maturation, uh, not aging. Um, and we have some ideas how we're going to induce uh, maturation. I think the simple one will be culturing them for a longer period of time, and you'll see uh, some of the channels or some of the mitochondria activity will pop up uh, more. The other ones will be uh, trying to pace them, trying to stimulate them, and so forth. But again, you know, I don't want to occupy the time here, but this is an area in which, as of today, we don't have all the answers, and this is a perfect uh, setup for postdocs and students to figure out how do you induce it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Tom. So this is for Juan Carlos, and I just was wondering if you'd be willing to speculate on what you, what you put forth as this kind of dichotomy between dedifferentiation method of regeneration and, you know, pluripotency differentiation. Looking at these model organisms that can regenerate without stem cells, and you, you, you speak to that as a a, a, a concept that we should think about in terms of tissue regeneration repair. Where do you see that interface between the biology of those organisms and the kind of stem cell differentiation? And what in a mammalian system do you think is a kind of appropriate target to think about using what we learn from the axolotl to improve tissue repair? I think that the early days after the animal is born could be a very good setting to look at. We are now having more evidence that mammals are able to do something very similar to what these animals uh, do during adulthood. So they can regenerate their hearts, they can regenerate their kidneys, and they use this de-differentiation mechanism. So you ask what could be a good setting? That, the neonatal mammal. Um, I want to insist, and this is because of my background, about the importance of the background of the cell, the education that the cell has, the, the embryonic trajectory that this cell has. And even though Inder is saying we have learned a lot, I want to stress that these cells, and we will learn a lot, they are produced in vitro. They don't have a niche. We are trying to recreate conditions by trial and error that maybe have nothing to do of how they behave in the animal. We are identifying something that is called embryonic stem cells, and not any person here, not anywhere, has seen a true embryonic stem cell in the embryo. They don't exist. We have created them in the petri dish. So I think it's very important that we look at what nature does. If nature doesn't use at this step of going all the way back. What we are creating is a different cell type that doesn't have the education that these cells had when they were growing up. And that's what I wanted to raise the concept of, look at that. So the neonatal animal will be ideal, and it will be very important in experiments like I mentioned, the blastocyst complementation experiment, that we compare the cells that the animal is normally producing with the cells that we are obtaining in the Petri dish. And I think we will find surprises, that they are very different. That doesn't mean that the cells we create in the Petri dish are not functional, or they are not going to teach us many things. But if we want to uh, respond in a specific way, we always need to look back at the education we had. And that was my point that I wanted to put here together today. Are there other questions? Maybe I'll pose the last question to Inder, and I'll purposely get back to, to this list. Admittedly, it's daunting, and it was purposely put up there to be provocative, and admittedly, you'd, we'd be paralyzed if we had to answer these before we got forward. Is there any concern that the very act of making iPS cells or reprogramming changes the disease, in your opinion, from what you want to investigate, or do you just go ahead do it, and then just see what, what falls out and see how represented it is. Well, I think everybody will realize that, that it may not be a complete phenocopy of the disease. So you'll have to really take case by case how close you become. For example, one we are interested in if we can actually recopy 
completely the differentiation deficient areas to go on to do that, that's pretty good. So it doesn't matter at that point whether you have a precise chromatin, that you have a precise methylation, and you look at the function of it. So I think it will depend on cell type to cell type. Okay, great.